Welcome everyone to my uh, knee deep in microservices talk. Uh, I'm Adam Chandler. I work at Container Solutions as a consultant. We help other companies with cloud native technologies. So, uh, a bit of a competition with Zibia. <laughs> it's nice to be at their offices today. <laughs> um, so, I work a lot with, uh, with companies who are uh, moving to cloud technologies and want to skip the puppeting part and also want to re-architect their applications to microservices. And these new cloud native technologies work really well with, uh, with microservices. And uh, companies find out that, uh, that microservices are not easy. And technological solutions don't solve all the problems, but some of them. So this talk will be about how cloud native technologies do help. What are the areas where they really uh, ease your way into running lots of small services? I'll get back to the definition of microservices. Um, and, and it's going to be a high level overview talk. So I got the uh, feedback to make it more down to earth and have some real life examples. I try to put them in and then I completely remove them because it just didn't work. Uh, so and why the theme of the talk is uh, my favorite game called Doom. Who has played Doom from the audience? Oh, very nice, very nice. Good audience. Uh, it's gonna be a bit of a, a, bit of a nostalgia right here. Um, so, uh, Doom is a game about uh, scientists on uh, Mars opening a gate to, uh, to hell to harness the energy of hell as a clean energy source. That's like a very good idea. It, of course, doesn't work out and the demons come out of hell to overtake uh, Mars, Earth, everything, and only uh, the Doom guy can fight them. So. My analogy, how I managed to shoehorn this into this talk is, uh, if you do microservices, be aware of the demons on the other side. Uh, <laughs> these guys. And be aware of the weapons you can use to battle them. I'm a bit confused about the ordering of the slides, as you can see. Uh, I haven't done this talk for a while. So uh, that was the story. Now let's get down to, to microservices. Uh, sorry, can you go back to the demo terminals again? Just so quick. <coughs> yes? <Yep>. Good. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Now we're talking about what I want to do. Yes. So uh, in my definition my, for this talk, because well, microservice is a bit of a vague uh, term and there can be more than one definition. For, for the sake of this talk, my definition will be services where the code matches, uh, is packaged into artifacts that then are deployed to production as is. So the, the, the code is not built as modules that are then compiled into one big S uh, executable, like in uh, this picture, or, or let's say they are compiled into multiple uh, multiple bar files or whatever files that you would deploy to production, but then are copied onto a VM and managed inside the VM by Puppet or, uh, or whatever. So microservices, in my definition, are that you have a module, a piece of code, which should be smallish. I don't, I'm not really hung up on the micro part of the whole thing. But it uh, should, be, should be relatively small, like a single purpose thing. It should be packaged as such, and your production system should understand it as such. So like if you deploy to a virtual machine in the cloud, then the cloud just knows there's a virtual machine and there is stuff running on it. It has no idea about uh, what that stuff is. And why would you want to do microservices? On one hand, it's easier to scale them. Uh, because you can just scale the parts of the applications in the cloud that you actually need to scale. Uh, you can have faster velocity. There are real trade-offs here. You're actually writing code might become harder in certain ways, but when you have a massive complex application, 
And you know you can just actually in production replace a small part of it without touching the rest in any way. That can really speed you up after you reach a certain level of complexity. Uh, resilience, if you, uh, you can have parts of your service go down and still other parts work, of course this needs a lot of work inside the application also, it doesn't just happen by breaking it up. There is lots of patterns of how, to, how you can do microservices, which I will not cover in this talk. And you can have cost optimization by better utilizing your computing resources, especially by just scaling parts of the application that actually need it. So we uh, already visited the demons and the weapons, that's gonna be the whole talk. So uh, cloud native technologies have been emerging in the last uh, two, three years, are a new way to run things on the cloud and they mostly address the artifact and production um, part. On the coding side, with tooling, you're pretty much left alone these days. There is not, I don't know about any big, uh, big improvements on uh, coding tools that would really help you with microservices, except for actual framework, but like IDE support and that kind of stuff is quite lacking. I'll touch some of it. Um, yeah, so the first, uh, first uh, thing you will, uh, you will uh, hit is source code management. More services will mean uh, you will have more repositories, uh, more code where you are not duplicate, where you are duplicating code because you don't want your services all to just depend on the common library, right? That's not that won't be microservices because you will end up deploying everything whenever you change the common library, or at least uh, will have weird dependencies or not being able to deploy something. So let's say you have really independent components. You have two options, how to ease your, uh, your management of them or like how to manage them because both are, the, these are the only two options basically. Um, one is the more natural way uh, is that most people go with is just have a repository for each service. Uh, this has the advantage of, do I have a slide about the, oh yeah. So, <laughs> The advantage is that it has good tooling support. All the uh, hosted CI tools, they ask you for repository, you put, uh, put a uh, uh, build configuration file, like in GitLab we saw, put that into the root directory, and, uh, uh, and that's, <coughs> we'll check it out and build it. Um, so that's, that's how these tools usually work. And it also encourages independent development. So uh, the repositories are really separate. Developers will get into the habit of just checking out what they're working on. And this works great when, you're, uh, when you actually like, have a development team per service. So if your <coughs> service is matched to development teams, then this is definitely the right way to go. When that match is not exact, um, then, then you will be running into the problem of like, okay, I want a new service for this small thing. And now I need to create a new Git repository, a new build in the CI tool, and that just gets sprawling. And usually, people just decide that maybe I don't need that to be a different service that much. So it's a it's a hassle with like setting up the permissions for the new repo, etc. That front using a mono repo can help. Just have one repository with directories in it, and each directory will be built and deployed as a separate service. From this point of view, it sounds super easy. The weird thing is that the tooling support is really bad for that. So the tools expect you to have to build the whole. Uh, you could put like a build configuration file into the root of that Git repo and tell it to like build each service separately. But then the build will run every single time you change any of the services. So not really the right solution for it. Yes. Um, it's interesting. I also miss one more part. Uh, in charge of this uh, repo per service that you can version, you can tag, you can release and upgrade your component fully separately without touching all your other deployment and production stuff. Yes. Which allows you to be much more flexible in terms of yes, the so less breaking. So my, uh, my point with the, with the monorepo is, I found this, um, is that you would do that exactly the same way just from a single repository with the build tool actually just 
like a single build configured in the build tool would only be looking at slash front end, and another build would be looking at slash admin and slash backend. You have to adjust your phone files or whatever yes. you use. So you would have to do that quite differently, yeah. and lots of tools don't really expect you to do that. So that's. Yeah. But I think it's a actually that's my preferred way is that one. So because you could even like. Uh, if you would have a really flexible build system, you can even configure it as whenever a new directory just appears, that's immediately a new build and new everything. So you could do really nice things with it, but it will be all very custom. So for example, that's why like Facebook uses a modern repo, but they can now make all their own tools because they have so many people. So it's not for everyone. Yeah. But maybe tools will emerge in time. It's not that hard to do, actually. It's just uh, that it's not so common. Well, actually for building? Sorry? Facebook uses uh, for building. Facebook uses Gradle, which has basic support for effort for uh, mono posters. But Gradle doesn't isn't like a central system that actually runs your builds. Gradle is just yeah that defines a build, but then something needs to actually start up the Gradle and like track what builds are running, etc. So Gradle doesn't solve that problem. Yeah. So same like you can put a POM file or uh, packages packages JSON file. Yeah. The, the only big difference is that uh, Gradle only builds what you actually actually changed. So everything is cached. So you can, if you change one module, it will only build that one module and the rest is cached. So for the day on the website, they, they say they, have, they built Facebook with about 1400 modules in one build. Yes, so they don't rebuild everything, of exactly. course, because that would mean that the whole platform goes down and then com yeah. comes up again when you deploy. So uh, yeah, so a uh, bit too deep now for a uh, okay. but we can talk about it afterwards. Um, next thing is packaging. That's uh, the main cubus, my packaging monster. Um, it's supposed to represent a monolith. Thing and, uh, so how do you package things when, uh, when you have a gazillion services? Also with microservices, you want to have the ability to uh, not just do language specific packaging, but you can, with microservices, you can actually have different languages talking to each other because everything is over the network, over HTTP. But then uh, your ops department tells you, but we only deploy war files, sorry. Uh, so Docker came around, um, was it I think three or four years ago, as a awesome way to package applications. Who here knows Docker? Yeah, okay, I don't really need to go uh, too deep. I'll just make my points quickly why, uh, why Docker is important. Uh, it's a packaging tool that not just doesn't just support the ops side, but is actually a very nice tool for developers to use, which makes adoption much easier at a company. Um, and you can run things locally, which is again the developer workflow uh, problem. Uh, it's actually much nicer than even when I was working at a Java shop. Even then, we couldn't run things so easily as you can now with Docker Compose. Uh, but of course, the uh, the main thing is that you can package any technology, even Windows stuff nowadays. Though that's still not that easy because of the like Linux-based roots of uh, of Docker. But even that works uh, to some degree. And of course, with different programming languages, anything that runs on Linux, you can uh, you can package into Docker, and it starts fast, which seems like a minor thing. But let's say Docker. Uh, competes here with virtual machines. In the virtual machine, you can package anything. And the, the problem with, with virtual machines, why, why virtual machine orchestration didn't really go <coughs> in the way like container orchestration is because they are slow, they're clumsy, they are big to transport. So it's a, a just, just the, the size and the speed of Docker containers made new things possible. Uh, yeah, and the fact that it's also, that because it can package any technology, it, it produced a, a big push for, for tools that run Docker in production. Because when you're, you have to build something that's like Node.js specific, there won't be that much momentum behind it because it will ever be only used for Node.js stuff and cannot be used for other things. But once you have a technology that, you, that anybody can use, you have a much wider audience and a much wider support for, uh, for pushing that technology. Next. Build pipelines, again, more services, more builds, and imps, and more deployments. And uh, so with containers, how the build pipeline will look like with containers, you'll have code that gets built into an image. 
that gets deployed to the development environment. Now, I will get around to container orchestration, but let's just say for now, for those who are not familiar with container orchestration tools, it's not just the image that you need to get onto the environment. You need to describe your application to the container orchestration system uh, in the form of manifest files. I will get around to those in more detail. You'll probably do some templating on your manifest files because your development environment, however much you want it to have the same as production, in most cases, at the very least, you will tune the number of instances you're running. Probably the memory usage, probably the CPU usage, etc. Uh, it never really works out to have an exact copy of production unless you're throwing a lot of money at it, which sometimes is the case, and sometimes in some use cases that's a good idea, but most of the time companies don't want to do that because they don't need to do that. Um, so a bit of templating, let's say tuning things for the, uh, for the right environment. And then there is the environment-specific application configuration that uh, like database, passwords, URLs, whatever you uh, you need, the admin user password, uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, that, is, that your application needs this configuration. There, the problem is rather secure storage of this stuff. So you will have a configuration per environment, and you will uh, and you need to store that securely and inject it into the application on startup. And I'll get back to this a bit with the with the container orchestrators. Um, yeah, and then there is a lot of tools that can uh, that can do your uh, do a lot of CI tools. Everybody knows a couple. I just listed these as examples. Um, what to look out for when you are doing Docker and cloud native stuff in these uh, these tools is. Well, the Docker ver version, basically, some tools are not that <coughs> friendly. With, uh, we had some bad, bad experiences with Circle CI, but things are moving fast. Maybe now they have the newest Docker version, but they didn't a while ago. Uh, can you run the tool from the command line, or is it like a clicky, clicky, gooey thing? I don't like the clicky, clicky, gooey things, because then the development of the whole build can be quite slow and tedious. Uh, especially if coupled with just this small thing that it doesn't hurt that much in Jenkins because you can click a button to start up the build. That can really speed things up as opposed to tools like Circle CI and Travis where you actually have to push things into the repo and then it has to, have to wait until it uh, realizes that you push something and then it starts up the build and it's super tedious. So I like CodeShip for that uh, because they actually have a command line tool to run your builds. And, and the very nice thing which is quite lacking, GitLab has to some degree, Jenkins has it, is pipeline functionality. So that the, the tool can actually orchestrate a set of steps, maybe with some manual things there, but you can actually push a button and say, uh, uh, now you can deploy it to production, for example. With, with, a, with actually a push of a bat button, or and you can see where at what stage a certain release of the application is in your pipeline. This is also not a very common functionality. It's usually just like run a set of steps, and at the end you get uh, you get an a report saying true or false. Basically, that's what you get from these new tools like Circle CI. So the uh, biggest demon of them all is running stuff in production. That's the, that's the really hard part. And that's also the part where cloud native technologies help the most. That's why the cloud native technologies are represented by the BFG, the big fucking gun. It's the biggest gun you can have in Doom. Uh, and that's how it goes if everything goes well. Uh, Sorry? It's not how you want production to do. No, it's like, uh, okay, maybe you need to work on the metaphor. <laughs> so, um, container orchestration. This uh, concept emerged from uh, the need to actually start up your containers in some machines in the cloud or in your data center. Uh, so the, the principle for the container orchestrators is having a master, I think probably the audience here knows, this, who, who works with some container orchestration engine. Okay, that's less than a thought. Okay, so we'll go a bit uh, more into it. Um, 
So the, the principle for each of the, the orchestration engines is having a master process somewhere in the cloud, probably several of them for high availability, etc., which will launch your containers on a set of virtual machines, or it can be even physical because Docker doesn't really need a virtual machine. So uh, that's the, the most basic function of a container orchestrator. You, you give it a manifest file saying, I want to run this Docker image, this number of instances, and it is running uh, daemon processes on each of the virtual machines. So once the master knows that this is what you want to do, it can actually talk, it can decide, like let's say this VM is already full, I will not run it on that one. I will not run it on this one, but so, so let's say I want to start up the second backend. So it sees node one is full, node two is full, node three. Oh, there is uh, node three is empty. I will run that container on node three. You can do this with other algorithms. Let's say you want to always use your empty nodes so that you're spread over as, ma as many nodes as possible. Or Amazon ECS can, for example, do uh, availability zone based thing so that it will try to run your containers in as many availability zones as possible, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and that's that's like the most most basic. That's the that's the scheduling part. Also, they can do things like run this container one instance on every server, which is awesome for monitoring. These mon running monitoring agents used to be a bit of a hassle. Every VM has to have it, has to have the latest version, etc. With a container orchestration engine, it's just magic. You just say uh, this is my mon this is you will download the YAML file from the uh, from the. Uh, website of the uh, monitoring system you use and just launch, tell, tell the container orchestration system to launch it. So that's nice, that's the, that's the scheduling part. And there are two, container, the two, two orchestration systems which are mainly schedulers. Amazon EC2 Container Service is a service managed by Amazon. That's your default thing once you're in Amazon to, to run containers. It mostly just does the scheduling, does that really well, has all these algorithms to, to spread out your containers over AZs or try to fit them into as few VMs as possible. Um, but that's kind of all it does. There is Nomad, which is from HashiCorp, and I don't know much about it, except for the fact that they did also on purpose, not a featureful thing, just, just doing your scheduling. But for your microservices, I think, unless you are attached to your Amazon application load balancers and whatnot, I think your, uh, your uh, choice should be more, well, Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. Both of these try to be microservice, but not just container orchestrations. They grew up from these roots of just running containers over some VMs, but they kept adding features which actually make them like nearly like pass-like platforms. Um, out of these two, Kubernetes is widely used in production, Docker Swarm, not so much. So uh, I wouldn't really recommend Docker Swarm. <laughs> um, maybe one day they will get there. And maybe if you don't have, maybe you'll be fine with it. I mean, there are companies using it, but let's say right now in the container orchestration world, Kubernetes is the big player. Um, it's a huge open source project, really supported by the big community and created by Google originally, but Google really stepped back and really put a lot of effort into building a large community. And it's really paying off, it's moving at light speed mm -hmm. and, uh, and working really well. Um, so what do these, uh, both Docker Swarm and Kubernetes both add this abstraction of a service? So your backends want to talk to your front-end pods. Which front-end pod? What is the IP address of a front-end pod? With containers, it's, uh, well, in VMs in the cloud, it's not that easy a question, but with containers, they can come and go. That's the whole point of having this orchestration. Uh, it's really a cloud, right, that you don't really know where they are, what is their IP address, and so on. Even just for them to have an IP address, there needs to be some networking magic to be implemented. And to, for them to act as a unified service, which has its own IP address, so the backends can just address that IP address, and then that will get routed to one of the front ends. In a, you will need to implement load balancing, need to implement networking. So it's a quite complex thing to do, but this is exactly what you want with microservices. 
because when you have a few services, you might still be able to deal with some IP addresses and whatnot. With, uh, with when you have lots of services, that problem just blows up. So both Kubernetes and Docker Swarm not only do they do this load balancing and the behind the stable IP address, but they also do DNS. So you will actually be addressing from the back end your front end as HTTP slash slash front end. And that will magically happen that your packets get routed to the right place. There is a really cool talk from a Google engineer whose name I forgot, Michael something, who explains how this works in Kubernetes. It's really awesome. And IP tables, magic and stuff, and uh, changing packets and whatnot. It really works really nicely. Or they use an, uh, an overlay network to like create a completely virtualized network between, the, between all the, the uh, containers. So that's one thing. Another interesting thing where Kubernetes is really ahead is the uh, cloud integration. So you used to have a cloud platform, Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, uh, whatever, and uh, you create all kinds of objects in it, like a load balancer, like a virtual machine, of course, uh, create persistent volumes. Now, this picture with uh, because uh, the developers of Kubernetes are not shy to add all kinds of fancy features into it. Uh, the picture gets a bit, bit of like an inversion of control in the cloud world. You define that your application needs to be exposed to the internet with a very tiny little YAML file, like three li lines of YAML, and uh, Kubernetes will process this and see that you want to expose your application and it has a plugin for the cloud it is running, it happens to run on and will expose your service and create a cloud load balancer in the Google Cloud in Amazon in Azure and configure that load balancer to actually point to your container platform where the request will actually be routed to your containers. So you will no longer have to actually touch the cloud. You can control it through Kubernetes up to a degree. Not everything will, of course, be, uh, be possible. For example, DNS, there is no feature for that. But, uh, but already the load balancers are a pretty amazing feature. The volumes, they came later because they are much harder to implement, but actually now you can have uh, containers just requesting, I want, for this application, I want a 100 gigabytes of storage. That's it. And the administrator of Kubernetes can configure what kind of uh, provider will provide the storage and Kubernetes will translate that into, let's say, an Amazon Elastic block storage or whatever uh, it is running. Here. So that's that's really cool. And uh, and provisioning of nodes. So I think that, I don't know if that works on Amazon, but it does work on Google Cloud. Uh, Kubernetes can spin up new virtual machines so it can auto-scale your cluster. If you have too many containers running, it can just spin up virtual machines. Actually, it's a pretty important feature, but uh, it, uh, it doesn't work with other uh, orchestration engines. What actually Docker Swarm has of this right now, I'm not that sure. So uh, I wrote it there because they are also doing something like this, but I'm not really sure where they are right now. Um, and more, configuration management, you can store your application configuration in the cluster and it gets injected to your application through environment variables. Uh, consider this against, let's say, having some configuration management system from where your application is, has to pull, so you have to put code into your application to pull in the configuration, or something like Puppet to actually write that to files, put the files in the right place, then your application reads the files, then it gets the configuration. Your application only needs to know that some configuration will come from environment variables, and the uh, orchestrator system slash microservice platform gets that configuration into those environment variables. It would be nice to have more integrations there, like with HashiCorp Vault, for example, but that's not there yet, but they're working on that too. Also self-healing, that's actually a bit of less, more, in, more in, the, uh, in the scheduling category. Actually, it's a really cool feature, just your container dies and gets restarted. So simple, uh, <coughs> Kubernetes does it together with liveness probes, so it actually you can configure how does it decide that your container is done, so it's not just about the process dies, but actually you can pull some health endpoint, and that also happens by magic, and it just restarts it. Sometimes you don't even need to scale out to, to have pretty high availability. If your process doesn't start up for 10 minutes, then you can live with like 30 second uh, uh, downtime, because Kubernetes just restarts your, uh, your container. 
So, uh, one problem you will face with these wonderful technologies is actually managing them. So, running Kubernetes is not simple. Docker Swarm and Nomad are much simpler, uh, and for for like general because they made it, made them a monolithic architecture. That's quite funny talking about microservices, and they, they are actually a monolithic architecture, and it works pretty well. So everything is packaged into the into the uh, into one process. You run the same process on all the nodes, so it gets a bit simpler. Kubernetes has a bunch of processes to run, but also nowadays has pretty good installer tools. But if you're not that kind of uh, organization where you have an advanced ops team who would run your container system, you have options for, for managed systems. So the best of them is Google Container Engine on one hand because they run Kubernetes, on the other hand because, they, uh, because the level of management that they provide is actually more than Amazon ECS or EC2 container and yeah, let's just call it ECS. So Amazon with Amazon ECS doesn't manage the operating system of the nodes for you. They manage the master of the cluster, so it's a very managed service and there's not even an unmanaged version of it. But you install your own operating system, you install upgrades to the operating system, you might install the wrong operating system which will have some conflict with some version of ECS. So you're, uh, it's, it's not that easy. Um, with Google Container Engine, they manage everything for you. You have access to your virtual machines. You can SSH into them. You can completely mess things up if you really want to. But if you don't want to do that, you can just uh, tell Google to, okay, now upgrade all my VMs and they do a rolling upgrade of your VMs and you have, don't have any downtime and everything works nicely and they have a really great track record. Sorry that this sounds like a uh, <laughs> Google advertisement, but yeah, they, at this moment in time, they are really ahead in this game. It might not last for long, but, uh, but at the moment that's the, that's the situation. Azure Container Service is managed Kubernetes, managed Mesos. I didn't mention Mesos, right? I forgot that. Yeah, I should have. That's one of the container orchestration systems. Uh, and managed, I think, something else. I don't know, maybe Docker Swarm. But they are mostly focusing on the, on the Kubernetes part. They are not there yet. Even like, yeah, they're really far from, from providing the level of support like with Container Engine. At the moment, they are more like an installer for Kubernetes on Azure, which is great, actually, because, well, you uh, have an installer for Kubernetes on AWS, a community supported one. Microsoft decided to make one for their own cloud. It's really great. They're getting behind Kubernetes. So once you're on Kubernetes, you can uh, say that, oh, okay, if I ever need to move to Azure, I can, or even AWS, just you'll have to be running your own cluster, which is a pretty big just, but uh, yeah. And then there are smaller companies who, uh, well, Docker is doing their Docker cloud. That's right now it's weird, but I'm pretty sure they're a good engineering organization. They will get there with it. Right now they're in some kind of transition beta period to transitioning from something else to Docker Swarm. Uh, Kubematic and Giant Swarm are both companies who run Kubernetes for you on any cloud. They are quite uh, on the expensive side, of course, because they, that business only makes sense for like larger customers. Um, yeah, monitoring. So, monitoring for uh, for containers. That used to be a that used to be a uh, big deal. Because monitoring solutions were uh, designed to work with stable systems. So you install the agent on all your VMs, and then on the monitoring uh, in Nagios or somewhere, you configure that, okay, these are my VMs, and now I want to monitor this and that about them. And once containers came along, suddenly it's a thousands and thousands of little containers running all over the place. and. Uh, and it looked like that's going to be a really, really hard problem to, uh, to solve how the hell to monitor containers. Actually, it turned out it's not such a hard problem because of the container orchestration system that's already in place if you're running containers. And because uh, you just need to change your perspective. You no longer want to monitor some things on that's, that run on VMs. But if you focus your attention that you have certain services that you want to monitor, 
and they happen to have a hundred instances spread all over uh, the cluster, you don't have to mind that that much. You can aggregate all the memory usage of all the instances, for example, and that's your memory usage of your service, or you take the average, or whatever. So it's it's actually not uh, technically to like implement all this. It's, it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, but in the end, this this all makes sense. That's what you actually want to know about your service. How many instances are there running? And have a graph about that. I'll show an example. Um, so these are cloud native monitoring solutions that all have really caught up with this. Like the, the monitoring world, they were like really let's go for this and let's solve this problem. And they, they you can see that there is not like one outstanding player, but like all of them are really good at this. Um, this is an example from CoScale. So, uh, yeah, one, one aspect that I mentioned here of the, of the quantity orchestration systems is they have APIs. They have really nice high-level APIs. Once you start your application quantity orchestration system, you define your application, what kind of services does it have. So it's a pretty high-level definition, and that's how these systems understand your application. And because they have APIs and all this data you can get out of them in real time, Actually, a monitoring solution doesn't have that hard of a uh, time. It can just go and ask the API of the, of the orchestrations of Kubernetes, hey, what services are running there? Oh yeah, that service, okay, how many instances does it have? All that stuff, Kubernetes just tells you. So, making a graph like this where there is the CPU time of the front-end service and all, all the other services is measured as an average over all of the of the running containers. This one, I did not configure these things one by one. I told CoScale I want a view of my every CPU usage of my services that happen to run on the on the cluster. And, and CoScale doesn't have an issue with determining what is a service really. Previously, that's been a problem because unless you were using, for example, passes were a nice place where also this problem could be solved. Usually they just, but then there is the constraint of a pass, like they just have their own monitoring thing and whatnot. And uh, here, as it's as the underlying system is an open source, open system, you, it actually makes sense for all kinds of monitoring companies to implement a an inter an integration with it, and pull pull out this nice list of services and make the graph as an aggregate. And here is the number of containers per service. So you can see as the load on the front end service went up the number of front-end containers so went up. Well, this is a bit messed up here. This, uh, I don't know what it's really showing. Also, it's saying all servers, not the why, but this is the actual number of front-end containers that, uh, that we're running. So you can see the scale up and the scale down event correlating with the, uh, with the actual CPU usage. So yeah, monitoring is a quite well solved problem in the, in the container world. And actually, these are sometimes better metrics than you used to have before. Of course, we still will want to monitor your VMs and whatnot just to see that something really strange is happening. But getting application-level metrics is, uh, is much easier. You can get much more just out of the box than before. Log aggregation. If you follow the simple rule to log everything to STD out, then you're pretty much done because there are tools that will run as a uh, daemon set, they call it in the Kubernetes world, in other orchestrators, it's something else. Uh, again, an agent that runs on all, this, all the instances. So you can just run that agent and it will collect all the logs and push them to ELK or whatever you want. For example, on Google, they push it to, of course, their own uh, stack driver uh, log aggregation if you use Google Container Engine. And uh, this is a really nice feature of theirs actually aggregates your your errors so like any recurring errors it uh, it shows how often did they occur and so on this is the error reporting part but the the important thing is again just you can very easily run an agent over all your nodes that pushes all your logs that will and it, and you just need your containers to conform to the like what is this 12 factor app whatever manifesto thing that says like you just log to std out instead of writing to files and you're good yeah, alerting is something you'll want to have. People tend to forget about that. Uh, not very hard to implement, just keep in mind that you will want that. But I really like this, uh, this picture. This is from the new Doom. Uh, they actually had a message for a demonic invasion in progress, so they're really, uh, that's, that's foresight. That's, uh, <laughs> or self-learning. 
Sorry? Or a system that learns by itself. Nah, I like to think they actually program this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was some AI. Um, yeah, and then uh, environments. Uh, easily creating environments is something is a feature only only Kubernetes has. There's something called namespaces, uh, where you can just create a virtual space inside your container cluster, where your containers will run isolated from, and you can start up the same containers many times. So basically, a whole application you can start up in a namespace. You destroy the namespace. Everything inside the namespace gets destroyed. Namespaces don't see each other. It's not a security feature per se. So if you if a hacker would want to, would run a container in your namespace, it could get to other namespaces. It's more useful for uh, for just running a test environment, a development environment. You want to test some feature branch, you can fire up that environment in seconds because a namespace is practically <coughs> nothing. It's just a virtual object in Kubernetes to like instead of prefixing all the names of everything, you just get a namespace and inside that you can you can run your containers. So in this example. Like you have a namespace for a feature, another feature, the development environment, and the production environment in there. Let's say you run your admin service, your backend, your front end, whatever. So that's a really nice thing. And with newest stuff in Kubernetes, you can actually use it as a security feature because um, on one hand, you can put resource limits on namespaces, so you can make sure that that development environment altogether will never use more than a certain amount of resources. Role-based access control can be used to control access to certain namespaces, so API commands cannot be issued by users who don't have access to that. Pretty basic thing, it's new. It's a new thing in Kubernetes, so you can see that this space is still now, like this, this technology is moving to the enterprise space where actually there is many teams on the same cluster and doing many things, so we actually need to control access. Um, and network policies, so this is just API control. Still the pods or the, the containers could talk to each other. Network policies enables you to, uh, to say, this container can only talk to other containers in this namespace or to that particular container. And this gets implemented on the networking level, so packets actually physically can't get to, the, uh, to that uh, instance where you don't want them. And that's, that's really, really powerful to implement such things on the networking level with just a high level YAML file that just describes things that uh, in, in, a nice, in a nice way. Um, yeah, we are, uh, I ran out of space on the previous, so we're going down into hell now. Uh, configuration management. Manifest files. Uh, so we will have several things to, to manage. Uh, when you're running containers on an orchestration system. Uh, you will have your manifest files that describe your application. I'll show an example in a moment. I, yeah, it should have come earlier probably. It's hard to imagine how, uh, how they look like. Uh, environment specific configurations and secrets, which are also environment specific configurations, but with a higher level of uh, security uh, needed. So how would you manage these? There are all kinds of options uh, and no like clear best practices yet. Um, this is how a manifest file looks like for a Kubernetes deployment. You say that it's called the front end. You say it has three replicas. You can do auto scaling also, but let's say you don't, then, uh, then you say a fixed number of replicas. You say what container are you running? What container image are you running? This is just to give it some name. Uh, what ports do you want exposed? What is your liveness probe? It's version slash hash for a weird reason. That could be like health or something. I wanted to uh, change this, but forgot. So uh, on port 3000, there is some endpoint that you, uh, that you can pull. Uh, there is some parameters for that liveness probe. Interestingly, this stuff, this is run by Kubernetes, this liveness probe. This is how it will know that your container still is. But when you, when you ask Kubernetes to expose a service, it will create a HTTP Google Cloud load balancer and grab this data from your deployment to configure. Also, the load balancer needs a liveness uh, configuration, how to know which backends to not route to, because that's just in there. You have to configure it whether you want to or not. But Kubernetes does it, just, just grabs this, this data here and configures that load balancer based on this data too. So you really don't overdo it. You really are just explaining how your application looks like and 
all the other stuff is, is implemented by the, by the system, by the platform. And also you define an environment variable, let's say log level, will be taken from the configuration map called Jupyter config and the key log level. So here you have to actually specify each environment variable, which is a bit tedious where they come from, but yeah, you, you've got to do that. They should have a shorthand, let's say, grab each of them from, a, from, the, uh, from the config map, but you know, so that's how it works. So you can see that this is a very high level description of, of an application component. No unnecessary details there except maybe few things like this name and that this bit of the configuration of the, uh, of the config map. So what you can do, one of the things, the simplest thing you can do to manage your configuration is put everything into the repo. Put the code, the environment specific configuration as several files, dev, test, prod, whatever files into, the, into that repo and put the manifest files there too. Well, upside, very easy to do, easy to keep things in sync, the right manifest files with the right version of the application, for example, let's say, let's say you implement a feature, rarely happens, but does happen, that needs a change in both the application and the manifest files because you're adding, you're changing the, the, the health endpoint, for example. In this schema, when everything is in the same repo, that's very easy. You just make one commit or one uh, merge where all the changes are there to, to both the code, the, com the manifest, and even maybe the configuration because you have to add the new configuration variable for some reason. Of course, it's not very secure because your configuration will be uh, in Git, which is not a, that bad thing if you're not uh, in some more high security environment because, of course, you already kind of trust your uh, source code provide source code manager to keep your source code safe so it's not a terribly it's not like usually the problem with this is when people commit the configuration to a public github project or something um, and the problem will be that you want to change something in your environment change the number of replicas from three to four and you will start kick off a new release of your application for that that's the uh, that's the big problem with this um, yeah, but it's a trade-off. I've done this, it worked quite well, it was annoying at times, but whenever we thought of the alternatives, we were like, nah, let's not go there, this is fine. The next thing you can do is store your configuration inside the container orchestrator. Uh, Kubernetes has config maps, that's what I was showing in the manifest example. Uh, in this case, if you move your configuration over there, and let's say Kubernetes keeps it safe, which right now is the Kubernetes support secrets, but they don't support proper encryption of the secrets yet. Yeah. It will come any moment now. Uh, they already the feature is in beta or alpha or something to uh, to actually keep keep them safe. Uh, but they're not in Git at least. Um, but with this, you place a new requirement on your cluster. It can never die because if it does, there goes your configuration unless you also keep it elsewhere. Um, and then the, the third is to keep everything separate. So with this, you get the security. Let's say maybe here with Orchestrator, you can, you can replace that with HashiCorp World, for example, or some other secure configuration management system. But then you have the problem of either that system gets integrated with Kubernetes to actually do the pushing into environment variables, or you will again have to write custom code to fetch the configuration from there and then you're not using that nice feature from, uh, from the orchestrator. So it's a, uh, I think HashiCorp Vault integration with Kubernetes is in the works, if I remember right. Um, and uh, well, keeping the manifest separately is an interesting trade-off also. On one hand, the example I gave when you need to change both the code and the manifest becomes a bit trickier, which one gets built first. But that's actually a rare case when you have to do such changes. Also, if you do like a new service, you can just create this code for the new service, build it and everything, but just add it to the manifest files after. So that's not a problem. The problem is rather combining the two when you're, when you're deploying. Let's say you want to build your code and deploy it, then during the build, you actually have to pull the manifest files from another repo. Or, or if you don't do the deployment during the building of your application, which actually is a good idea, then uh, 
then again, you have to interact with this other repository, and it places extra requirements on your uh, on your uh, build pipeline. That's why I was saying that the pipeline function, the orchestration function, that is really nice. It's really good to have a flexible uh, flexible build system to implement all these kinds of scenarios, and it's not clear which is the best one. It's lots of trade-offs, so I'm just like presenting that problem here. Uh, it, there is no no silver bullet solutions to this. And then there are more technologies that are trying to solve it, and the funny thing is they are really trying to solve it in quite different ways. So, uh, but I will not even mention them here. So that's, uh, I don't know what's, how long I'm talking, actually. Am I talking for one hour? No, I'm not, right? Uh, that's just because I opened it uh, <laughs> early. Okay, then I have this picture, which uh, I actually don't remember what I wanted to say with this, and it looks very complex, <laughs> so I just skip it. Uh, this is the last thing now. Uh, yeah, so in the end, uh, doing microservices, you will hit the familiar old problem. How these other people? Um, how do cloud native technologies help with this? Um, this way. So you can have, with, with, because if you're having a microservice platform that has that level of abstraction high enough, then you can actually have a nice separation of responsibilities between operations and developers. You can have operations uh, responsible for running the platform and maybe keeping some cloud services around it working and being advisors to the developers on how to craft their manifest files and so on and have the developers deploy using manifest files, which means they practically have full control over their production environment but with the constraints of the platform and with the high level interface of the platform. So they don't, learning Kubernetes will not be easy for the developers or for the operations, but it's way easier than going SSHing into machines and writing some bash scripts to, to deploy stuff. So it really changes that picture of, uh, of ops dev cooperation. Also what I've seen is happen is uh, ops wrote thousands of lines of puppet scripting. And then there is a, ch there is a uh, like cultural push to let's, let's do DevOps, let's be friends, let's, okay, developers can touch the puppet scripts, they can help out with that and, and so on. And then the developers look at the thousands of lines of puppet scripts and they're like, yeah, we would love to help, <laughs> but um, how about you guys just take care of that stuff, right? <laughs> so with this, also the manifest files in a, in, a, in a real complex system will grow and grow and grow, and there will be pushback from what I've seen having pushback from developers like, oh my god, what is this Kubernetes thing? And, and there is a lot of concepts to learn, um, but, but they are learnable and they, are, they make sense as opposed to like weird scripting things. They make sense to describe your application. It makes sense to, to say what the liveness probe, probe is. It takes some time to learn all the parameters of the liveness probe and why do they exist and what happens if you change them. But uh, with some training, this, this, is, this is actually, in the end, learning Kubernetes, even running Kubernetes, will be much easier than doing the puppet thing. Or Ansible or whatever is your uh, poison. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Any questions? Yep. So the manifest file describes. Uh, let me go back there. Compositional size. Yeah. So the manifest file describes how your application kind of looks like, and then the application needs a log-level configuration to for per environment and every environment the log level on development you might want to set it to higher. Theoretically, you could hard code the log level into this manifest file, that's also an option to do, but, uh, but you usually want to keep that separate, especially secrets, you really want to keep separate from your manifest files. So that's what I mean, like manifest files should kind of be the same for every environment, with maybe some small differences in like number of replicas and stuff, but the, then there is the really environment specific configuration, the database is always different, and, uh, <coughs> and anything, not, not much comes to my mind like the log level, uh, these things. So what you usually deal with is configuration. <coughs> usually this stuff you don't you don't think of as configuration. This is this is more of a description. This is a manifest of your application. In general, the manifest and the configured file which application means and uh, manifest 
Yes, that is, this is, this is, yes, exactly, that's a very good, uh, <laughs> actually better definition than mine, yes. Uh, this is, uh, the manifest files are processed by the orchestrator, the configuration is processed by the application. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Anything else? Very clear or very boring? Yeah. <laughs> there is some other configuration tools like console and all. So, yes. uh, in compare with uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, Docker Swarm, and all, some like that. Yes. So that's the that's a very interesting uh, difference. Uh, do you guys know uh, Spring Cloud? Mm -hmm. uh, the Spring Boot, Java World, Spring stuff. So Spring Cloud goes in the way to their idea of doing cloud stuff or cloud native stuff is you build components into your application that do the cloud thing. And, and for example, your application will talk to console. Console will be your distributed uh, configuration store. Your application will have a piece of code compiled into it that talks to, sorry, uh, talks to console, pulls in the configuration. Now, Kubernetes will, instead of this, it will manage the configuration or pull it from somewhere and inject it into your application using environment variables. Now, uh, why I like this approach more, though the end result is kind of exactly the same, but uh, it pushes a common infrastructure functionality into the platform. So it will be taken care of uniformly for all your applications without having to inform, uh, enforce some coding guidelines and some stuff that you have to depend on this library. And the worst thing about Spring Cloud is that you still have to run console, right? So it's not really solved in the Spring Cloud components. You still will have to run console. And with Kubernetes, you have to run Kubernetes, but then all the features you get come from that running that one system, so you will not incur additional complexity. Once you're running Kubernetes, you get all the orchestration stuff and you get the configuration management stuff and everything else and the monitoring, the log aggregation, all that you get basically for free because the system is already running, it's already managing all your virtual machines, so you can just start piling functionality on top of that base layer. That's, that's my answer to it. Let's do one here and then back to the side. Okay. Uh, what operating system does Kubernetes and all the other applications usually run on? Because uh, a year or two ago, there was a lot of hype around CoreOS, which was the really minimalist yeah. operating system just for managing things. Where is Kubernetes typically installed? Do you have a lot of options? CoreOS is, a, is, is one of the main options. Google decided to do the, roll their own. Now there is a Google container optimized OS, which is again a thing is that yeah, that this whole way of running containers takes so much responsibility away for the OS that it no longer makes sense to have much in the OS. You just want the OS to run the container, that's all you want it to be able to do. So yeah, CoreOS is one of the common operating systems to run Kubernetes on and then Google, when you're running a Google container engine, you'll have the Google operating system. It can run on pretty much anything else, uh, but of course there is a list of like more supported operating systems because things can always uh, be different but but running on Debian, Ubuntu, stuff like that it's uh, it's all fine but running on a really minimalistic OS like CoreOS uh, it makes sense really from a security perspective because you have a much narrower attack surface because simply the operating system is not running a mail server in the background for you or whatever so uh, it's just uh, and makes management simpler but it is a hassle so once you're not running on a managed version of kubernetes by somebody else uh, there you can run into we will we will be solving these kinds of problems so this version of the os with that version of docker and that version of kubernetes and, uh, yeah. interestingly amazon ecs is a managed service and they say run it on whatever i don't believe them that it just works on whatever but they also have their own ami they are like Container optimized, ECS optimized, AMI, but they also say this, that you can run it on whatever else. I guess they have too many customers already used to the U using their VMs and stuff. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they're pushing in a bit different direction. Yeah, yeah uh, 
uh, uh, you were talking about earlier like uh, the approach where in the module service where you have a cold uh, artifacts like the yeah. deployment and, and then you se segregated the deployments uh, rather than having everything in one VM, you have separate deployment. Yes. Now the question was uh, in terms of interacting these uh, microservices at runtime mm -hmm. with each other, uh, there is two approaches. Like one one to one, I mean, whenever you want, you can have a link between one container to another and keep on. Uh, you can have a spaghetti out of it and then you can factor one and two. Mm -hmm. One other is like you can have a some kind of service uh, discovery and connecting and those kind of stuff. Yes, the service discovery is a given. So that's like that's. Uh, that's Oh yeah, that's the service discovery part. So this service will be available on the network under a known DNS name that will be front end. Yeah, but that's minus inside itself. Do you suggest to have something a third thing to manage this part of service discovery, which or you don't need it. Kind of so kind of uh, normal way ESP layer kind of thing uh, for your. You don't need it because Kubernetes does that for you. The fact okay. that a DNS uh, uh, thing called front-end exists on the network and you can talk to the DNS server and it will return you an IP address and that IP address will actually load balance to all the instances, that's all the service discovery you need. You can hard code into your backend if your backend would be calling your front-end for some reason, it's just a stupid example, but uh, uh, if your backend would need to call your front-end, you could hard code HTTP slash slash front-end into your backend, you don't even need to have it as a configuration because that will always be available on the network. So that's again a different thing from, if you would be using console, you would ask console, hey, I want to know this front-end thing, what's the IP address, and it gives it to you back to you, and then you talk to the type address, and then you need to deal with the load balancing. In Kubernetes, this is all pushed down to the network level. It's the same functionality, it provides all that stuff, but on the network level, which I think really, really works great. The only thing you lose compared to, let's say, Spring Cloud is the Spring Cloud does client-side load balancing. That means in every client you can configure the load balancing a bit and do it maybe differently. So, of course, with Kubernetes, you have the one type of load balancing that it does for you. And But even there, theoretically, there could be configuration. There isn't options yet, but theoretically, there could be other things than now it's one So, uh, So, so the, the point is, pushes it down into the networking level, the problem. Uh, if I understand correct, Kubernetes can set up you know all kinds of persistent uh, storage in you know whatever cloud provider so you have. Does it also handle setting up uh, backups and archiving? No. So you have to roll that on yourself. No. You have to roll it yourself. But there is a very interesting development uh, that Coro has started these days um, uh, called operators. And the operators are supposed to be processes running in Kubernetes that completely manage something like a database for you, including backups and everything. Of course, there's the same really complex problem that nobody has been able to really solve in a completely automated way before, so why would they be able to do it now? And I think why they think they have a shot at it now is because Kubernetes already provides such a great API to like oversee everything that's happening on the cluster a lot of the problems that before you had just even figuring out whether some instance of MySQL is actually even running or whatever and how to run it somewhere else, all that disappears, that becomes super easy. So in this code for the, uh, for the operator, you can actually focus on the more difficult problems and just have the, the rest taken care of relatively easily. So they're not there yet, it's not like you could run MySQL already with backups and everything. But, but that's the direction they're taking. It's a very interesting thing to keep an eye on. And there is simpler operators. For example, I said there is D Kubernetes doesn't manage the DNS right here. There is no DNS there. But, uh, but people have written a DNS operator. Just, it, just, it, is, it will be a process that is talking, listening to events of the Kubernetes API. Whenever something gets started, like a new service, you just, whoops, they no service. I now call the API of my DNS provider, register a new DNS name, and it's done. That's an operator. So like the dual code between what's happening in Kubernetes yes. and the outside world. Yes, exactly. And there is an operator for like volumes and nodes and load balancers, or they should be, but they are more tied into the core, and they are now ripping them out a bit to make it more modular, but that's how it works. Yes? 
What makes you do the doom drop? Okay, so we now know all the demons and weapons. Yeah. Practice or playing doom? Yeah. Uh, for real? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. and, uh, <laughs> love for the game. Yeah. And just uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm very much uh, musically. I'm into heavy metal, and doom is the closest to heavy metal. Uh, game can get is just carnage and destruction and uh, <laughs> ripping monster. I mean, really just, if you don't play, just watch the, uh, the, the uh, trailer videos of the new one. They're like going and just tearing monsters apart. Yeah. It's like, it's awesome. Yes? So, I mean, there are a few critical book posts out there of running Docker infection, you know, Yes. So there are problems and so on. Um, if you run on premise, you're not using these optimized AMIs or what, what's your statement? Like, is there a good, good with Docker on front? So, um, lots of people are doing it. It's uh, it's no longer a rarity to to have companies run Kubernetes in production, even on bare metal. Uh, for example, uh, one well-known company. Albert Heimer doing it. They're running Kubernetes on bare metal and it's working for them. I'm actually uh, running a small meetup called Kubernetes Addict Support Group where people who are doing actually Kubernetes in production come together to talk about it and the topics are not like, oh my god, it's crashing every second day. The topics are more like how to do this advanced thing. But the bare metal thing can bite you. So that's, uh, that's something don't expect that to get up and running in uh, two, three days. So. There you will need to figure out all kinds of networking issues and uh, operating system issues. But, uh, but it's not about the optimized AMIs. So uh, uh, CoreOS is great operating system to run Docker and Kubernetes on. Docker Swarm claims to work on pretty much whatever. So it's, it's not, not, that's not, the, not really the, the problem that you don't have the AMIs. And, the, and running in a cloud, Kubernetes has installers and stuff. So like, there is some tool called Chaos that can install it on Amazon, just like this to specify some parameters and it's up and running for you. The problem where why we rarely advise companies to actually run their own Kubernetes if they have another option is because, is because when, when something goes wrong and you have to have knowledge to debug that problem and, or restart, the cluster or fix the or restore uh, there is inside kubernetes there is etcd which is a distributed data store that is storing all the cluster state of kubernetes that's what the api server talks to well if that goes nuts then uh, you might want to kill it restore from backup for that you also have to have backups and stuff like that and so it's a uh, it's it's not the not like starting up a vm What are the most common pitfalls when starting to use Kubernetes? Um, well, not learning it properly is definitely one. It's usually like that uh, that ops guy who likes the, all the new stuff, pushes it through at the company and then leaves, or doesn't leave but forgets that, and then everybody's hating it because nobody knows it's really how to properly use it. And then the ops guy, instead of like sending people on training, uh, decides to write some custom deployment scripting around Kubernetes, which sometimes, by the way, makes sense because against that API, you can write some pretty funky stuff without actually writing lots of code. But still, if you only do it because you want to hide the fact that Kubernetes exists from your developers, probably not a good idea because. Building a pass is not worth it when your base layer is already that high level, high level of abstraction like Kubernetes is. So, but uh, yeah, this is this is probably the the usual problem that people don't learn it properly and then get surprised like what the hell is, is going on here or start to use it in some completely wrong way. Or and with microservices, for example, what I see sometimes is people have microservices, have them dockerized, can run them in a Docker Compose, they have this beautiful uh, development environment and everything, and then they build and deploy all of them together. So they have a 
distributed monoliths practically uh, just always treat them as one thing and then it even makes sense especially in the beginning of the application life cycle when everything is changing all the time anyway but uh, the bad stuff is that people start to people don't mind the dependencies between these services and then they suddenly are in a state where that has to start up first and then that has to kubernetes thankfully doesn't have any functionality to order startup of services so you can't have that uh, because you should not have that and that's that's also a uh, Alright, well then uh, thank you everyone for uh, listening.